Hello, I'm Robert Nord, guest editor of the IEEE Software Special Issue on Technical Debt, and I'm here with Carolyn Seaman. Dr. Seaman is an Associate Professor of Information Systems at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Her research generally falls under the umbrella of empirical studies of software engineering. Dr. Seaman's current research includes a focus on technical debt in software engineering. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank it you. Has been it has been 20 years since Ward Cunningham coined the technical debt metaphor. In your experience, Carolyn, are people aware of technical debt, and is it a useful metaphor today? Yes, I think it's a very useful metaphor. Um, I find when I talk to practitioners and, and researchers alike, um, even if they haven't heard the term technical debt, as soon as I start um, explaining it, what it is, they immediately say, oh, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's, it's very useful because it takes a phenomenon that without the metaphor is a little bit hard to explain uh, when technical and non-technical people are trying to communicate with each other in an organization. But everybody understands death and what it is. Everybody experiences it in some form or another. Um, so the metaphor works really well. It's not a perfect metaphor, but, but it works really well for communication purposes. It's also useful because it introduces this whole other domain, the financial domain, it's inspired a lot of um, a lot of ideas about how to deal with technical debt. So it sort of brought in a whole host of of new ideas and new approaches uh, to try out. Not all of them will work, but some of them might, and some of them might be very useful. So yes, I think it's a very useful metaphor. Okay. And can you s say um, more about how we can extend the metaphor? Is technical debt really like a debt in real life? You know, can it be measured in dollars, for example, or in other financial measures? Yeah, yes and no. <laughs> okay. It's it's like debt in real life. Uh, it, it has a lot of the characteristics of debt in the sense that you take on debt to to accomplish something in the short term, knowing that you're going to have to pay it back. There's going to be some sort of price or pain in the future. Um, so that sort of central part of the definition of technical debt is true, or, or of debt is true both in financial debt and technical debt. Uh, the, the biggest place that the metaphor breaks down is in the uncertainty. When you borrow money from a bank, you know exactly how much you're going to have to pay back and when you're going to have to pay it back, and that's not true in technical debt. So, so planning for technical debt is a little more complicated than planning for financial debt. Um, but a lot of the, the core parts of the definition that people understand um, it is the same in the two. In, in addition, including um, there's sort of an emotional element to the debt. I mean, people, I find most people I, knew, I know are a little bit, um, have a little bit of a, a guilty feeling about taking on debt, and I find that with developers too uh, when I talk to them. There's sort of this gut feeling of they don't feel good about the debt, and, and they understand that it had a purpose, but they really like to get rid of it. And that sort of visceral feeling, gut feeling, I find very similar both to financial debt and technical debt. And as far as measuring it in dollars, um, I don't think we're there yet. I, I think my vision is that yes, we will be someday be able to characterize uh, technical debt in terms of, of dollars, or actually in terms of software development. I think the more appropriate measure is effort. Uh, but that you could do either one. But I don't think we're there yet. Um, in order to put a number on technical debt in terms of dollars at this point in time, uh, would be very shaky. Because um, there's just a lot we don't, don't know, and there's a lot of uncertainty, but, but I think someday we will be. Uh -huh. Yeah, so you mentioned you've been talking to developers. So you've recently went out into industry to check on how software developers experience technical debt, and your, report, your mm -hmm. results are going to appear in the special issue and in an article, a balancing act, what software practitioners have to say about technical debt. So could you tell us a little bit of the highlights um, of that study? What did you observe from the interviews you conducted? Sure. Sure. Yeah, there were a couple important takeaways, I think, from that interview study. Um, I, I certainly learned some things that, um, that challenged my assumptions about how technical debt really works in the real world. Um, one thing that came through loud and clear, and we've heard this other places too, this wasn't a big surprise, is that technical debt is unavoidable. Um, from a practitioner's point of view, there's really no point in trying to avoid technical debt. It's going to happen. Um, managing technical debt is what's important. So management, not avoidance, is, is where we should be focused. That's, that's not really a big surprise, but that came through very, very strongly. Um, one thing that surprised me that came out of the interviews 
is that most technical debt is intentional. Okay, we, we talk, sometimes talk about intentional technical debt versus uh, unintentional technical debt, where unintentional debt is sort of the, the nobody's really paying attention and the code sort of decays over time. Um, intentional debt is where somebody in a, in a management or a decision-making position makes an explicit decision not to do something or to delay some maintenance task um, in order to, to meet a deadline or, or to get something out the door. So what our interviewees told us in this study is that most technical debt, in fact almost all the examples of technical debt that they told us about were intentional, where there was um, that there was a decision to incur that technical debt. So what that says to me as, as a researcher is what we really need to be doing is, is providing support for decision making at both ends of the cycle. Before that, I had been thinking more about decision making uh, to help people decide when to pay off debt. But really the practitioners seem to need just as much help um, when they're trying to make the decision whether or not to incur technical debt at the beginning of the cycle, in the beginning of the process. Um, so that was an important takeaway for me as a researcher, um, and an important insight, I think, in, into how technical debt works in practice. Um, what else? There were a couple other things. Uh, one thing people said over and over again is that it's really important to make the technical debt explicit. Um, that a lot of times technical debt, or individual developers know about certain places that have a lot of debt, but they don't write it down, or they assume everybody else knows about it, or um, you know, it's, it's just not uh, not recorded in some way, not documented. And a number of the people that we talked to said, you can't really the first step in managing technical debt adequately is to make it explicit and make sure everybody knows where it is, and, and so they can talk about it, so they have ways to talk about it. So that that was that was a good point. Um, so that was sort of the first step in how to manage technical debt. Unfortunately, beyond that, we really didn't find a lot of um, a, a lot of good ideas or good proven methods for measuring and managing technical debt. Um, when we ask people, how, how do you manage technical debt, they said, well, tell me what other people tell you. <laughs> you know, let me know when you find a good way to manage technical debt. And there's really a, um, a need, a desire for good ways uh, to manage this phenomenon. Um, they know it needs to be made explicit, but beyond that, it's, it's really difficult. Okay, so that's a good segue to our next uh, question. So that um, you commented on some of these gaps. You've also written about managing technical debt as part of the research agenda for the software engineering field. So then can you comment on, you know, what are some of the important challenges to be addressed in moving forward? Yeah, so, so one of the important challenges is there are, there are some good ideas, what look like good ideas out there in the literature and in the blogosphere. Um, people say, well, this is what you should do, this is what you should not do. What's missing is some validation of those ideas. Um, a, a big um, one, one of the many problems of, of my technical debt research is to try out some of these ideas, um, getting a, a, and they have to be tried out in practice. We can't do this in a laboratory because there's just so much, so many contextual factors that play a role. So, so I've been trying to get some of my industrial partners uh, on a very small scale to try out some different measures, different uh, ways that um, to, uh, ways that have been proposed to measure technical debt or to manage it, um, and, and see how it works. Um, you know, it may, be that, it may be that the way that people are managing it right now, which is really implicit and, and really ad hoc, maybe that's good enough for right now. I don't know. But, but we won't know until we try it. So the biggest challenge from a research perspective is getting some of these ideas out there and in use, and then getting feedback from the people who are using them to figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, because what we write, what we have right now really are a lot of uh, a lot of good ideas, or hopefully good ideas, but we don't know how they really work. Hmm. And yeah, another, so you mentioned conducting um, research another, in this area. You uh, recently received an NSF grant to conduct research on technical debt. So why do you think there is now mm -hmm. interest in funding such research? Well, you know that's interesting. I'm, I'm not sure I know exactly. I have some suspicions. Um, I think the you know, the metaphor has been around for a while, um, but I think it took it took somebody in practice, because I think the practitioners use this term, or have been using it for quite some time, at least some practitioners have, but somehow that term never really um, infiltrated the research community, because there are way too few connections between the two. We all know that um, industry and our practice and, and research don't come together nearly as often, and it was really 
completely serendipitous and by accident that I was exposed to this term because I've never heard it uh, among researchers. I've never heard about it in the literature. But I happened to be discussing a completely different subject with a set of practitioners. So, um, but I think once on the research side we started talking about it, it the, the value of the metaphor is so obvious because people immediately know what you're talking about. It's one of those unusual metaphors that crystallizes the phenomenon, something that's complex. And, and makes it very, very understandable to almost anybody. So, so it just was a matter of, of bringing that metaphor to light um, on the research side as opposed to just the practice side. And I think it could be very fruitful uh, once we get things going between those two sides and get some real dialogue and, and some real, uh, as I said, trying out these ideas in, in practice and getting feedback from practice into the research side that we can really make some progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in terms of making progress, you're in a unique position to understand both the research and industry perspectives, having worked in the software industry as a software engineer and having conducted most of your research in industrial and government settings. So as a final you know, question, can you um, say a little bit more, what can other researchers and software engineers do now to help the technical debt uh, research agenda succeed? Well, I really think it all has to do with um, with really studying how these things work in practice. But there are some there are a few research questions I think that can be studied in the laboratory. Uh, for example, there are a lot of code analysis techniques that claim that they can play a role in identifying technical debt, and that may be true. Um, but again, applying those tools and those analysis techniques on real software, finding what it is they pick up, and then and then examining those things, those results of those tools for their impact on future maintenance. And there are a number of different ways you can do that empirically and even in the laboratory. But, but an actual empirical evaluation of some of these ideas is really what we need. There are lots of good ideas out there. We need to start testing them. And that's where researchers come in. Um, we're good at testing things and empirically validating things, and we need to be doing more of that. Okay. Well, Carol and Seaman, thank you very much for talking with us. Sure, thank you. I enjoyed it.